Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Onyx. On today's episode, we have Mark Livesey of Treeline Pursuits and the owner of the Treeline Academy e-scouting masterclass. Mark has spent most of his life living in the Midwest, but chasing elk every year in the West. E-scouting is extremely important for those of us that can't get the boots on the ground. So in this episode, Mark is back on to discuss the top 10 elk finding concepts and how to link them together to apply them to your own strategy. This is one that you're going to want to listen to more than once and get your notebook out because there's a lot of gems in here. So the East Meets West Hunt podcast is presented by Onyx. The Onyx Hunt app is your premier GPS hunting app that turns your phone into a working GPS. This time of year, I'm scouring the maps on the desktop version of the app to look for areas to scout during the spring, as well as potential hunting locations for my annual western hunt. The new timber cuts feature is an essential part of my spring scouting. I love finding timber cuts in the 3 to 8 year old range and if you're hunting federally owned public land, Onyx will show you all the details of those clear cuts. If you want to check out the Onyx Hunt app for yourself, head over to onyxmaps.com and use the coupon code EMW to save yourself 20%. Tethered is a company founded on the principles of educating the hunting community on saddle hunting while creating the most innovative, lightweight, safe products for saddle hunting specifically. I'm using the Phantom Saddle System with the Predator platform for all of my mobile hunts. To learn more about tethered and saddle hunting, head over to tetherednation.com. Maven is building the highest quality optics at half the price of their competitors through their direct-to-consumer business model. They want to create the best optics for the job, period. The products are back with a lifetime, no-fault warranty, and an incredible customer experience. I'm using the B2 9x45 binos on all my western hunts. It's a low-light monster and allows you to be able to see through the binos longer than you can with your naked eye. I have a video that I took a few years ago hunting elk in Colorado where I showed this. Where I took my phone and put it up to the scope and then pulled it away to show you how dark it was. It's pretty amazing. So if you can use the coupon code EASTMEETSWEST-GIFT for a free gift with any full price optics order at mavenbuilt.com. And Spartan Forge. Hunters require an accurate forecast of the best hunting days and best hunting spots to save time on scouting and actually executing the hunts. The Spartan Forge Outfitter utilizes years of military background and machine learning to pull from millions of data points to accurately predict deer movement utilizing GPS data, 30 years of weather data, academic and state research. They're using the science rather than someone's opinion to figure out the movement for your specific hunting area. You can use the code East Meets West to save 25% off of the outfitter at SpartanForge.ai. Okay, so for today's Mountain Buck Story of the Week, otherwise known as Mountain Buck Monday over on the social media, I have a story from Ryan Roper. So Ryan's story goes, I began getting pictures of Steer about two weeks before the Arkansas archery season opened. He showed up sporadically through October and was primarily nocturnal. With the rut activity ramping up, I took a week's vacation during November's modern gun season to try and get in front of a decent buck. I ended up hunting some other areas during opening weekend with my son, targeting another buck that was showing up more frequently on camera. The following Monday, I decided to hunt a travel area close to where I had pictures of this deer in October. After spending all morning in the stand and seeing good movement, I slipped out to check trail cameras. This buck had shown up at a nearby food source early that morning before daylight. I decided to give my travel area another chance for the evening sit. I hunted that afternoon and hadn't seen any deer until just before dusk. I heard some deer coming down the ridge towards me. Much to my surprise, this buck was with a doe coming straight at me. I was able to get a shot and he fell within sight. This is my best buck to date and I feel very grateful to have the opportunity to harvest a great animal in the Achita Mountains of Arkansas that I call home. 
And I apologize, Ryan, if I mispronounce the, the mountain range there in Arkansas, but this is, is such a great buck. You can see a picture over on uh, the East Meets West Hunt social media on Instagram and East Meets the West Outdoors on Facebook. It's such an awesome hunt. And he's also repping uh, the EMW Zone rut stash shirt in it and a gnarly mustache of his own. So, Ryan, I uh, greatly appreciate you sharing this story with me. And I hope anybody else that uh, has some success with a mountain buck to send in your story, just a brief paragraph is all you need and a photo for me to share and and be able to share on the podcast. So thanks for sharing that. Also, so last week, the long haul, um, well, yeah, last, last week, it's been just over a week since the long haul, the, the Pennsylvania mountain buck hunt film released on YouTube. And it's been pretty awesome to see the amount of support and amount of people tuning in. It's just, pretty incredible it's been the best film to date from that standpoint and i wanted to go through the winners uh from the giveaway so i had a bunch of things to give away here so i'm going to run through them here and you can reach out to me if you're one of these winners Bo b-e-a-u at eastmeetswesthunt.com send me an email uh with your information so first of all i gave away a tethered phantom saddle system and that went to justin garant and the sicka fanatic hoodie went to mr heckman was the youtube name and then also an iron will k1 ultralight knife that i've used for the last couple years skinning my elk caribou deer uh coyote just about everything i've used with this knife and that went to ryan leary some maven apparel goes to ryan tanner uh, East meets West uh, vintage adventure logo shirt goes to James Papa. And then I had five Onyx memberships and they went out to Joe Post, Chasen Tails, Jeremiah Johnson, Carter Van Buskebaum, sorry, Carter, uh, Jeremy Frampton, and then also had some Spartan Forge memberships and hats. And those went out to Zach Smith, Kyle Kokanovich. Ryan Greenewalt, Carrie Morgan, and Aaron Hepler. So if you're any of these people that won and haven't reached out to me yet, shoot me an email and I'll get you set up with anything that you won. So thanks everyone for participating and checking out the long haul. If you haven't already, head over to my YouTube, which is just my name, Bo Martonic, and you can find it there. I'd If you do, if you like it, subscribe to the channel a whole lot more mountain buck and some western stuff to come okay so on today's episode as i said earlier i have mark livesey on and he's back for round two here couldn't do it all one podcast i don't think i could do it in 10 podcasts with this guy he's got so much information and this is another e-scouting gem if you want to check out mark's e-scouting master class e-scouting elk master class um head over to treelinepursuits.com or treelineacademy.net and use the coupon code East Meets West and you'll save yourself $20 on the course. With that being said, here's Mark and I hope everyone has a great week. All right, we're live. I'm back on the, the mic again here with my Montana buddy, Mark Livesey. Mark, it's good to talk to you again. <laughs> Bo, it's glad, it's good to be back on. I guess our last conversation went, we didn't even get halfway through your agenda, so we had to make this two parts, I guess, huh? <laughs> yeah, I know. We were, we were laughing about that. We had all these things, you know, we were going to talk about, and I was like, you know, we're uh, we're a ways into this already as far as time goes, and we're, we're not even halfway through it, so I think we're going to have to split it up a little bit. But, <laughs> hey, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always happy to have you back on. <laughs> Well, I'm glad to be back. So, Mark, for um, for anyone that's listening, I, first I want to say I recommend you going back to listen to the the first part that we had, um, which was a couple weeks ago, um, to listen to Mark's full entire background and the first part of this. And but for for Mark, some of the people listening here, do you want to give a quick you know sixty second elevator pitch on who you are and what you got going on? Sure. 
I always, you know, I, I think I mentioned this on the first podcast, but I, I really enjoy getting on some of these Eastern Midwestern podcasts because this is really my roots. I, I grew up in Missouri, whitetail hunted since I've been eight, nine years old, mainly an archery guy. Obviously, I've done some rifle, but grew up in Missouri, chased whitetails. And early in my 20s, I got this passion or this desire to hunt Western you know, big game and really centered on elk and just started making the track. I mean, Colorado, Wyoming, New Mexico, this is back when you actually draw a New Mexico tag uh, on a regular basis. And so I just would cycle those states and just sometimes hunt two states a year, depending on how many tags I could draw or what I actually got drawn. But I just loved elk hunting and I just got so immersed in it. And when I started you know, Google Earth was, I like, I love to say this all the time, but Google Earth co- cost like $399 when I started. <laughs> and in the, in that, in that late eighties, early nineties range. And uh, so, you know, there's been quite a progression obviously to where we're at now. And so I just, you know, I just worked real hard on trying to find places that held elk tried to develop a strategy that worked for me. And over 30 years, um, I just, you know, I just became immersed in elk hunting. It just was the thing that I lived for. It seemed like I looked forward to it almost as much as anything. I've done a lot of fun, exciting things in my life. At least I think I've done some things. It's been a lot of fun from triathlon to all the sports I've played and things like that. But elk hunting's always been probably my most consistent passion, you know, throughout my years. And, and then finally, five years ago, my wife just literally came to me and said, okay, you know, this business, we own our own business. And it was, I, I was working a lot, seven days a week, tons of hours. And she said, you're done. You're not getting to do what you want to do enough. We're packing up, we're moving West. And so she gave me one year to sell off some of our businesses. And I didn't think she was serious at first. And, um, I wasn't even sure we could do it as much as I wanted to do it, but we just, we'd never even been in the state of Montana and we auctioned off all of our stuff. (laughs) We sold some businesses. We rented a 26 foot box truck and we moved to Montana five years ago. And uh, now I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm like a kid in a candy store now. And uh, I'm still hunting four or five states, sometimes four or five states a year, almost always three. And so not much has changed other than I've expanded the number of states and the diversity of what I'm hunting. So anyway, that's a short history. And then I started Treeline Pursuits, kind of when I got here, just start giving back to the sport that I love so much. And I didn't really know where I was going to go with it. I didn't know what I would do. I have a lot of passions for some several different aspects. Most people know I make my own dehydrated meals. I really, I'm, I'm pretty into e-scouting, as you can tell. And so it really led to this path of creating this course. And so now I started this Treeline Academy concept, and I've got some big plans for that. And the first on the agenda was really to share my elk hunting, e-scouting knowledge. And so far, it's been just a you know labor of love, if you want to call it that. I've enjoyed every second of it. And that puts me where we are today. Yeah, I that's that's an awesome backstory, and and you can definitely tell as we were talking before we got on here your passion for e scouting and for elk hunting, and it's it's definitely infectious. So I got I got a ton of great feedback from that first episode, which we dove into hunt plans. I mean, mostly in in identifying those hunt areas, your core hunt areas and zones of pressure, which, which was kind of interesting to me. Some of the feedback that I I got from it, Mark had to do with even people being able to apply some of these things, some of these strategies for, you know, white tails in the East for mule deer, for everything else. And a lot of these things, you know, I definitely seem to carry over, which was, was really interesting to me. Well, it's funny you said that because I just looked with the publicly challenged podcast and he heard me talking about analyzing access points and trailheads and going into Google Earth and using the historical 
timeline slider to go back and look at parking spots and trailheads and analyze them year after year after year. And not only for how much use they look like they get, but at certain times a year, you might get lucky and you might get an image from, let's say during elk season, September 15th, and you could start, well, are there 25 cars there? Yeah. Or are there zero cars there? Uh, and he was telling me that he heard that and he starts, he started doing that in, in Illinois, looking for, he's a big mushroom. He's a forager guy for mushroom hunting and for whitetail hunting. So, you know, like you said, I, I, I think it's some of the stuff seems pretty obvious, but I don't know that maybe a lot of people just don't think about how to apply it. And so he got that tactic from how I use it for looking at the zones of pressure as far as, does it look like it's a Walmart parking lot at this trail end, or is it like, just like a little turnaround or, and how many cars are there at different times of the year? And we were talking about it and I'll just mention this real quick. I know we got a lot of things to cover, but for that example, most people also don't realize Bo that Google earth, on X hunt or on X maps, however you want to go with it, Gaia base map, go hunt.com. All of these aerial photos that from all of these different platforms are all different. Now, every once in a while you'll run across one or two that has the same aerial photo, but I have done a pretty exhaustive testing in this and where these people will get their aerial photos, the sources or the satellite resellers or wherever it is, all the third parties, they obviously are not signed up the same plan. So it's really, really valuable to use multiple tools in the aerial photo range because you're going to see all kinds of different images, you know, and with the hunt platforms, you don't really get to see the date. Obviously you don't know how old or how new those images are for the most part in Google earth. You can, and it has shocked me, Bo, how radically different the images are between all these various applications and platforms. And I don't think that a lot of guys, unless they really dig into it and start doing some analysis, really understand that they are that different. And I think everybody thinks there's one slight rolling around up there taking all these photos and everybody gets their images from the same one. Well, that is not what's happening. <laughs> so it is, it does pay big dividends. It's a nice tip maybe to just start off with to look at multiple platforms to get different views, different angles, different dates. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you're saying and then being able to go back and, 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 you know, compare them and take a look at them. It can be huge, especially depending on the time of year and everything else. I, I totally agree with that and learned, you know, a lot of that from, you know, I've used a couple different platforms, but mostly on X and, and Google earth. And, you know, just, I, I've, you know, been kind of thinking that from, from listening to you as far as different, different places to look from and different, you know, products that are out there and to be able to, to see those different aerial views. It's, it, you know, depending on the tree cover, or the leaves on the trees, you know, all, all that stuff, right. snow cover, all that different stuff can be, can be different in those. So I know. Well, there's nothing wrong with having your, sorry, Bo. No, no, no. Go ahead. I said, there's nothing wrong with having your favorite, you know, like I know you're on X guy and I don't know if you saw my last video I just put out a couple of days ago, but man, I, I love the new on X radius feature they just came out with. And, um, but you can have your favorite platform, but don't overlook checking into maybe some other platform, Google, especially Google earth. I find a lot of guys that once on X came out, or once guy or whatever platform they're using, once those platforms came out, they kind of just stopped using Google Earth. And I don't think they realized how powerful Google Earth is in addition to those platforms. I'm not, I don't, I'm not meaning in replacing the platforms. I mean in supplementing your work in those platforms. So there's absolutely nothing wrong with picking your favorite and and there's a lot to be said to really knowing how to use and really focusing it on one. But 
Also, keeping in mind that sometimes you have to use the right tool for the right job. I say that a lot, probably too much. And uh, it's something you probably want to make sure you keep in your back pocket. Yeah. You, you know, that that's that's so helpful. I mean, especially I, I've, I've been doing this for a while, but also or doing this for a while as far as being able to export some of the, you know, waypoints I'd create in Google Earth and put them into Onyx and be able to use that. And through your course that I've been going through the e-scouting elk masterclass, like I, I've been even learning more and different strategies for that and and being being able to use those in conjunction and say i'm only taking for me personally i've only been taking onyx into the field with it but by being able to use you know google earth and that in conjunction and being able to say pull data points that i've made or waypoints in google earth and then being able to import them into onyx like that's that's huge to to be able to do that they, they can work together like that yeah, yeah, it's a great it's a great combination for e-scouting. You know, using a a hunt platform like Onyx coupled with the resources and the quality of the aerial photo images in Google Earth, it, it's really. I mean, if you get nothing from this podcast, you you really can really elevate your research by combining those two platforms. Mm-hmm. Definitely. So, Mark, on this on this episode, I really wanted to focus on a portion of your course that has to do with the elk finding concepts. And I know that there's a ton of information that goes within here. So I'm going to try to do my best to to help direct it in a way that we can kind of cover it at a high level. <laughs> um, and and you mean to keep you mean to keep me on track? You can say it. Yeah, you can say it. No, it's just because there's so much information that's here. It's difficult to to do it. So if you were to give kind of an overview of this elk finding concepts here, what how would you give a uh, a quick overview of what that is, and then then we'll dive into some of the specific concepts. Okay, so that was, a, you know, it's, it's interesting that you asked me to give the overview because when I started working on this course, Bo, I was all over the place. I'm just going to be honest with you. I could not figure out how I wanted to organize it. I had all this information, pages and pages and pages of journaling. So how I originally started, let me back up a little, was I just sat down and started journaling for almost for a year. Every time I pulled up, on X, every time I pulled up Google or every time I started looking for another elk spot or a mule deer spot, I really wasn't focused on elk in the in the beginning. Anytime I did research for tags, strategy, migration, like I just did this whole exhaustive thing on migration patterns and theory. And anytime I did any of that work, I just would journal little notes and little tidbits. So after about a year, I had just this massive amount of text, which was highly unorganized. And so when I started going back through it and I started thinking about how am I going to extract this and get presentable and usable, I finally hit me how I really go about it is I've always said this, this is something I've always said, but elk hunting is about stacking odds in your favor. It is no more complicated and it is no more simple than that. Elk hunting is not one silver bullet. It's not the North Slope. It's not a bench on a North Slope. It's not a meadow. It's not a canyon. It's not a fire zone or a beetle kill or travel corridors or a saddle or a funnel or water sources or wallows or glassing spots. It's not any of those things. What it is, it's a combination of all of those things. And I approach elk hunting, the way I approach it is trying to stack as many odds multipliers as possible in my favor when I on every elk hunt I do. And what was clear to me, it was that the odds multipliers really are elk finding features or elk finding concepts. And there's about 10 of them. It depends on how you break them out. I kind of lumped some together, but if you break it out, there's about 15 different ones when I really did it. But now in the course, I combined a few that made sense. But as far as features and what I call odds multipliers, there's really about 15, 16 of them. 
you know, the first one of the course we can come back and revisit is meadows and feeding zones. Obviously with elk, they, they spend a lot of time feeding and they spend a lot of time on grasses and forbs. So meadow are real attractive elk and they're also attractive to hunters, but there's a lot more to it than just meadows. So I lump meadows and feeding zones into one of the elk finding or odds multiplying concepts. Canyons, creeks, and drainages, that's a pretty big module in the course. I'm really dialed. I really spend a lot of time waiting. Drainages, canyons, basins, bowls, and how they relate to travel patterns for hunters, how they relate to the landscape, what general direction they face. So that's a whole module in the course. Fire zones, logging areas. I separated those because I treat those pretty similar the way I approach them. And, you know, fire zones are one of my favorite. It's not probably not my favorite elk finding feature, but it's right up there. Probably my favorite features coming up. But fire zones, there's a lot to fire zones. It, in my opinion, when it comes to finding elk that are using fire zones, how they use them, why they use them, how they come and go from those fire zones, what makes them attractive to elk, what makes them not attractive, how much access those fire zones have because of, you know, when they, when they're fighting the fires or when they're building roads in, or when they log these fire zones after the fact creates, you know, it creates travel corridors for hunters. So the reason I, I lumped logging and fire kind of in the same modules, because they, they kind of end up the same way sometimes. Personally, I like fire zones a little better than log areas, just from, I mean, just a personal preference. That certainly does not mean they're any better. And in certain parts of the country, Washington, Oregon, big deals. And so really analyzing the age of logging areas and the same with fires, there's just so much. That's one of the longest modules in the course because there's so much about those two that I felt like I wanted to put out there, you know, for would-be elk hunters. The next one is sparse timber and beetle kill. Sparse timber I deal with on a whole different level, but I decided to lump those two because they're basically the same thing. Beetle kill creates a sparse timber environment for the most part. Depends on how invasive and how complete the beetle kill, you know, affects the, the timber or the conifers. But like in Colorado, saying that you like to hunt beetle kills in Colorado, well, the entire state's a beetle kill virtually. So it doesn't really, uh, the principles are not as applicable maybe in Colorado as they maybe they are in other states because the beetle kill is so widespread in Colorado. So you have to get a little more specific, but I really get into how to really analyze and age more appropriately with beetle kills. It's all about the age of that beetle kill. And I go through a lot of methods on how you can age that beetle kill. And a lot of people like don't even really know you can do that. And it's vital. It is absolutely vital. If you're going to concentrate on a beetle kill area, you need to know how mature that beetle kill is. Or is the timber still standing? What's it going to be like when you get there? And there's techniques that you can do from home using e-scouting theories that will help you with that. Sparse timber. You know, I'm finishing up the late season module right now, and sparse timber is a big focus for me late season late season. What I mean by sparse timber, I mean timber that see the ground clearly and well with Google Earth or whatever analysis and making, so what that means is the light is penetrating the canopy and it's able to offer up enough light to get an incredible vegetative growth. And really see a lot in that sparse timber is a lot of woody plants grow up in those types of environments. Not as much grass, but a lot of woody plants, deciduous trees. And those, those elk really key in on those types of vegetation environments in late season. So sparse timber beetle kills. The next one is a, is a really big module. Benches and slopes. We start talking about how to look for benches, not just one bench, but chain benches, micro benches, um, staircase benches, and how to look at them, benches, funnels, I mean, that are below funnels. And then as part of that module, I also talk about slope evaluation. 
what what degree slope do elk prefer? And most people don't really know. There's a lot of research been done on this. And you can really use some of this to your advantage when you're breaking down a really big area and you're looking for elk in an area and there's a lot of good looking area. Well, one of the things you can look for, not the only thing you should be looking for, but one thing you can be looking for is the degree of slope. There's certain slopes that elk just love to be on. And there's a lot of research supports and I talk about that in that module. Travel corridors, funnels, and saddles is another module. That's kind of self-explanatory, but saddles are not just places where elk go through or they want to travel or it's the path of least resistance. So I'm looking for saddles that work in conjunction with these other features I just said. I'm not looking just for a saddle. I'm looking for saddles that feed a prime bench, especially chain bench. I'm looking for saddles that, that feed earth. In the late season, I'm looking for saddles that feed a, a pretty, I don't want to say straight line, but they feed a corridor down to various elevation bands. And then funnels, you know, funnels like in a funnel where the unburned timber connects another part of the fire zone, like the way we hunt whitetails. I mean, that's a big whitetail strategy. I don't know if it is where you're at, but in Missouri, in crop country and, you know, meadows and these funnel areas are really prime for whitetail hunting. They're prime for elk hunting too, uh, especially with pressure. The more pressure, the elk just do not walk around in the wide open all day long when there's a pressure in the area. So these funnel areas or these pinch points are really valuable, especially today, in my opinion, as popular as elk hunting is getting. So funnels is part of that module. And then water sources and wallows. You know, in some areas, water sources are really important. In others, like Montana, I mean, for the most part, in most areas of Montana anyway, there's the eastern side's a little drier, of course. But for the most part, in Colorado and Wyoming and in Montana, I don't worry about water sources all that much when it comes to elk and in alpine environments. And then glassing spots, it's not really an elk finding feature, but it's really a key part of putting these all together. And I spend quite a bit of time in that model as well. So that kind of covers kind of the elk finding concept. So maybe we can revisit a few if you want to, um, what, whatever you find of prime interest. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think one, one thing I want to start out with here is in the, in the first part of that with the, the meadows and feeding zone, uh, I, I think that you, you, you touched on it there at the beginning, you know, that's something that hunters seem to flock to, um, when it comes to meadows. And so how, uh, you know, as with them being an obvious food source for elk, why, or how are you looking at meadows and those feeding zones as far as how are you able to identify something that catches your eye versus something that you think might catch everybody else's eyes, um, when it comes to hunting pressure? Well, in the course, when it, you know, on the meadows part of it, I have like rules to live by when it comes to meadows. <laughs> meadows are touchy for me when it comes to elk because it is probably, I don't know if it's probably the most prominent, but it's dang close to getting the most attention from other hunters. Meadows are what people look for when they're looking to find elk. They're looking for the meadows and they're going to those meadows. The elk know it. That's where they encounter people. So now I'm not saying meadows aren't good. They just have to meet some criteria for me. Now that doesn't mean I know there's going to be people make comments. Well, I know that there's a trail running right to this meadow and there was elk all over it. Of course there is. There's always exceptions, but you got to remember what I said earlier. I'm not interested in exceptions. I'm not interested in once in a while. I'm not interested. If you're going to be a 10% elk hunter, you can keep subscribing to that concept. Well, it happens or it could happen. Do elk live on the South slopes? Of course they live on the South slopes. But if I had to pick a slope during archery and I only could hunt one, it would not be the South slope. That does not mean I don't ever hunt on slopes. It does not mean there's not elk there. But you've got to, the, I'm going to reiterate again, in my opinion, you've got to stack these odds in your favor. 
And Meadows is really a big one because it does get a lot of attention. And Meadows, plain and simply, are hunter magnets. They just are freaking magnets, especially if they meet this criteria. I almost always avoid Meadows. I, you notice I said the word almost that are within two to three miles of a road. And especially if they have a trail running to them or through them, if that's the case, I tend to not give that a lot of attention. Now that doesn't mean that elk are not feeding in those meadows every single night. To me, it just means the odds, the odds of me catching one during shooting hours in that meadow with that kind of potential human activity around that meadow is going to be difficult. So when I find a meadow like that, that I do feel like it's in a prime elk spot, I will look at what services that meadow, what environments are available leading up to that meadow. I start looking at the benches that are within a mile or two miles of that meadow. I start looking at the drainages leading to those meadows. I start looking for fire zones that are near those meadows, you know, beetle kill slopes that maybe are near them. The elk will still use those meadows. Elk love to rut, especially during the rut season. They love to rut in the open. They like to get their cows out there. I don't know if it's because they think they can keep a better eye on them. They can just run them around better, but they tend to want to like to do it. I do agree with that. But sometimes it's very limited amount of time for shooting hours. So I have some rules when it comes to meadows, and I kind of go through those in the course. It's exhaustive. But right off the bat, if they're within a couple miles of the road, if they've got a trail running to them, they're not high on my list. Now, if I can find some meadows that are off the road and there's no trail and there's some significant terrain between me and those meadows, they're becoming, they're moving up higher on my list. So what I like to find instead of these big meadows is I like to find chain meadows, what I call dispersed meadows. meadows like little small meadows or small openings. When I say small, I mean just a couple of acres or two or three or maybe even 10, but just a chain or linked up versions of these meadows with some sparse timber edges. Man, those are elk magnets. And those, even though they're hunter magnets as well, potentially, they're not as high on the list as those big looking Beautiful looking meadows on aerial photos or this big open slope. But when you can find kind of these chain or dispersed meadows environments, especially in the bottom of drainages where the bottom of the drainage has got a flatter topography, I really like those types of meadows and I'll key in on those. But when I'm looking for a meadow, guys, I'm looking not only for the meadow, I'm looking for the, the, appearance or the inclusion of these other elk finding features I'm mentioning. I'm not just focusing on a good looking meadow environment. I want to see other environments. I want to see edge environments. I want to see habitat transitions in those areas. I want to see good looking drainages that feed those meadows. I want to see benches. Where are these elk going to bed and how are they going to move around and move around? Where's the water? If there's a, if water is of a concern, how does it relate? Do they hit water coming to the meadow or do they hit water when they get the meadow? How will the elk maybe, you know, there's no guarantees on this, but try to visualize how the elk might be using those meadow environments. I hope that made sense. A little bit of sense. Yeah, no, it, it, de it definitely did. And I, I love that how you were, you were, bringing up the point about how first of all then none of these things that you're talking about are standalone you know features it, it's you know being able to uh, as far as apply or how i want to put this how they're uh multiplying linking, together. linking yeah. together yes linking together that was what i was looking for yes with some of these other features and everything and and as far as you know finding those types of meadows that aren't as you know stand out on the the map or like you said easier to access and in a, in accordance to some of those other these other elk finding concepts that you have but i think that that you covered that that part pretty well um 
I, I wanted to, so how does, when you were saying a little bit about how some of these meadows at the, the bottom of the, the canyons or the, the drainage there yeah. that, that stick out to you and wh- why exactly is that as far as down in the bottoms there? Okay. So, well, that brings up, let's just jump into it. So the second one, the yeah. second elk finding feature in the course is canyons, creeks, and drainages. And you're going to find as you work through the course, or even as you listen to this podcast, it's all about how you link these all together. You know, I know we just said that, but I don't want to underest I don't want to understate that. It's so important. And I talk to them all the time that get pretty tunnel visioned on why well, I look for North facing slopes. And then I go in there and I'm like, well, I do too, but I'm looking for, listen, let me back up. Let's say, for arguments that I've got this list of elk finding features. And if you break them all out, maybe there's 10 of those. Okay. If you can find seven of these features in one area, in one hunt area, you know, general area, let's say a five mile diameter, whatever, a radius, whatever, you know, reasonable distance, you need to pay attention to that spot. I'm not saying it's a, the best spot on the map. I'm just saying, You've got a spot that has seven odds multipliers stacked in there. It's worth some real investigation. And so maybe, you know, bring me back. Let's get back to that. I'm going to talk about how I know if spots are displaying multiple features. I'll talk about that maybe towards the end. Um, yeah. I really haven't even talked about that at Harley in any, in any podcast. And it's probably something that it's not even a mo- I don't even have that module done yet. And so that's probably a good way to wrap this up, but canyons anyway. So when I'm evaluating a drainage or a canyon or a creek bottom, I'm looking at a couple of things. I I don't care if the drainage runs north and south so much. I do like those, but what I'm looking for is north slopes in those drainages that look, that meet some of these elk finding features. They've got, good benches. They've got the right slope degree. They may be some dispersed meadows up on those slopes. They have some nice looking ridge lines, maybe some micro or sub ridge line or feeder ridge lines coming down into the bottom. And the, and the and range is broke up into multiple feeder ridges, especially if they're running northerly directions and are they got a northerly facing slope direction? I'm sorry. So, but what I'm really looking for when I'm evaluating these kind of drainages is I do not like particularly, I don't focus a lot of attention on them except maybe in the late season. Okay. Later season. I don't like V bottom drainages. So when you're looking at your contour maps, when it looks like a V or an A, when you're looking at a contour line, that's got a sharp point. I know that's kind of basic, but for guys that maybe struggle a little with topography map, when you're looking at the bottom of a of a drainage or a creek, when you're looking at a creek running and you see these bees or these sharp points, what that means is the bottom of that drainage is pretty V-shaped, meaning it goes right down to the creek and right back up the other side. I tend to not like those kinds of places as much because I want places – that hold moisture and those usually are indicative of steeper runoff drainages usually and they also don't hold moisture as well so what i'm looking for is those more relaxed v's the v's that are not as close together and that have a flatter curve to the top of them so think about an a if you're thinking about an a or a v that has Let's just think about the V. The V comes down and then it kind of has a, a curve before it starts to go up. Does that make sense? It's got a more relaxed look to it. What that means is the drainage has a little bit more of a flatter bottom to it. And when you get into those types of environments, what you'll see a lot is moisture will stay. You'll see a lot of buck bark in those kind of more environments. You'll see a lot more vegetation. You'll usually see a lot more water, a lot more chances for nice wallows, a lot more chances for dispersed meadows. Because what happens is they'll get so moisture laden, they'll kill off the trees. 
and that will grow up in vegetation. Incredibly attractive environments for elk. Now, when I find one of those that doesn't have an established trail running in the bottom, I get super excited. <laughs> they're not hard to find. I mean, they're very hard to find because I don't know if you've looked at a topographic map, but most of the trails that you see are either going up a ridge line or they're going up the bottom of some canyon somewhere or drainage. So any of these canyons and drainages that have these flatter bottoms that do not have an established trail showing up on the topographic map. Now that doesn't mean there's not a trail in the bottom. That just means there's not one on the map. Those are really high on my list for that feature, for the canyons, creeks, and drainages feature. In summary, I'm looking for canyons, creeks, and drainages that have a flatter or displaying a flatter bottom that have openings up the bottom every now and then. They don't have to have a lot of openings, just that dispersed meadow, a little meadows here and there all the way up those drainages. And I'm looking for no trail in the bottom. And I'm looking that, is there a north slope that serves as that? Anywhere. It could be a small north slope. It could be a wraparound bowl, a small little bowl that has a north facing component. And then if I start seeing benches that are three quarters of the way up the slope above these types of, oh man, I start getting, I start getting goosebumps when I start seeing stuff like that. <laughs> well, Mark, right when you're, as you're talking about this and the way you're explaining that <laughs> it comes up to the, in my mind, this spot that I hunted in Colorado that, that had that, it was, it was, wasn't at the very bottom of the drainage, but I'd say, I don't know, it was it was about a mile below where it got up into the Alpine, and it kind of created that more of a U-shape rather than the A, and in that spot, there was a couple of small meadows that had there, and then even within there that you couldn't even see on the the map but there was like almost little swampy areas that linked to those together and inside of that timber that was there was just full of wallows and all the way up through and then had the north facing slope with a nice yeah. you know nice bench below this cliff face and when i was in there i screwed up on every encounter but i had an unbelievable time two years in a row hunting this spot well, there you go. I just yeah. told you that gives me goosebumps. So maybe you yeah. just added, hey, and I want the people listening to know we did not talk about this before. No, <laughs> no we did not. And it's no, actually, it's it's funny because we had I have so many different things written down here. But as we're as we're going through it, I'm kind of changing direction on on uh, how how I like this going i like the way that you're kind of transitioning this here and trying to you know figure out how all these things are are multiplying together and linking together i think that's that's so i think that's so incredibly important and you know and sometimes it's hard because as elk hunters you especially you know guys that are new okay i'm just going to say this guys that are brand new at hunting elk they're like sponges okay they're like a little kid you tell them something as a dad, <laughs> so to speak. I'm old enough to be the dad of most elk hunters. Um, and they're just going to absorb it. And they're going to be like, okay, okay, okay. But if you talk to a guy that's been elk hunting for five or six, seven years or more, they have some bad habits. I'm just going to tell you. they Not really bad habits, but they have preconceived ideas in their head of where they find elk, right? Yep. So sometimes it's hard for them to accept the fact that they need to maybe ex be expanding their search. Now, maybe they're killing elk every year and they don't need to change their ways. But I do run into quite a few guys that have been five or six years elk hunting and they're having, you know, limited or poor success. And they're kind of looking for, you know, to spruce up their tactics. And I think what what I'm trying to present to them is let's open up your thinking a little opening up when you're looking at an area, keep an open mind and start trying to link these elk finding features together. Don't get caught up on meadows. Don't get caught up on north slopes. Just start marking them. Okay. I might as well just say it. I keep alluding to it. Yeah. So you're marking all these elk finding features. Okay. As you're going, not even really paying much attention to the significance of them. Now, if I find a really prime looking one, 
I use, I have this whole elaborate, honestly, I'm not going to get into it here, but I use this whole elaborate custom markup strategy from a priority to a secondary to a tertiary. And I have ever, I have an icon that I use for each one of these elk finding features and I stick to it. So when I label an icon, all of these things, eventually it just starts jumping out. I can look at an area and say, man, look, there's nine of these features within a square mile. And it's like, I need to dig in here a little more. And it just starts the, I call it the cluster effect. And you're just going to start seeing if you, if you, if you mark these features like this, you're going to start identifying these clusters and it's going to start painting a picture of a hunt area real quickly. But if you don't mark them and you're just kind of keeping it in memory, how many times have you e scouted and you're like, Oh, that looks good. Oh, that looks good. That looks good. And then all of a sudden you're, and then all of a sudden you're on the other side of the mountain and you're like, well, that looks good. And then when you're all done, you got nothing on the map. You're like, okay, now what was I looking at earlier? Yep. <laughs> and I mean, I get so down the rabbit hole when it comes to e-scouting. And so I developed this custom system a long time ago and there's no, there's no right or wrong way, guys. All I'm saying is just build one for yourself that works for you, that you like. It doesn't, there's no method to it. It's just a way that you can organize your waypoints and your, I call them, you know, a lot of people call them points of interest, whatever you want to call them, the way you can organize them. And like, for example, I'll just tell you one tip that I use real quick. All of my points of interest, when I first put them on the map, are all default icons. Like in Onyx, they're the red X, right? Every point I put is a default every time. I never give it an icon until I'm ready to give it one of two kinds of icons. I'm either ready to label it as an elk finding feature, a meadow, a canyon, a really good canyon spot, fire spot, whatever, different spots that I'm looking at. Or I'm ready to prioritize it. And I hardly ever do that right off the bat, unless I just stumble on a spot that looks just like one you described earlier, just a really fantastic looking spot that needs more investigation. Then I'll give it a star. I use a star icon as my top priority spots. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I find a spot that I just think is bold, I'll throw a star down. And then I use the number one, two, and three to give a priority of if it's not a star, but it's still a good, still looks amazing, I'll give it a one and then a two and a three. And if it's just some ran, if it's just a random bench that I'm not really ready to give it a one, two, or three or a star, I'll just give it my bench icon, whatever I'm using in the different applications. And I know that sounds complicated, but it's really not once you start doing it. And you don't have to go to the level that I'm doing it by any means. Just come up with a system. Because I can tell you, if you had access to my OnX right now, or Gaia, or whatever I'm in, and you looked in an area and you saw nine or ten stars in the same drainage, you'd be like, he's probably going to hunt that spot at some point. <laughs> and... I don't put just stars down unless they really are important. So it makes it real easy when I go back because I e-scout a lot of different places at the same time, guys. I just do. That's I found that's my best approach. It keeps me from getting centered or getting too excited about one hunt area. It keeps me from being biased. I'll talk about that a little bit more. It's real easy to get all your marbles in one hunt area because you just believe that's the spot. I try super hard not to do that. And the reason is, is I want to keep my mind open to the possibility of other areas that could end up being as good or better than what I'm looking at. And if you get kind of tunnel vision on it, so I'll jump around a lot. I'll spend a little time in this area. Then I'll jump over and spend a little time in that area. And I found when I come back, I'll see things I didn't see the first time. And I, I just have found that that strategy really works well for me as I start to flesh out three to five different hunt areas. And I'll just work a little on it at each one. I won't try to complete one to the end in one fail setting or one swoop or one setting. I'll jump around. I got a little off track there, but it, it's no. kind of important that we start talking about these elk finding features that you don't just look for these that you come up with a strategy on how you're going to label them, identify them, and kind of re revisit them, so to speak. 
No, I, I think I think you took that in a in a great direction. I think that that's one of the things you said there about having a, a bias on a certain area, or you think that looks good right off the bat. I am so guilty of that. I know that I know that's a weakness of mine. I'll find a spot that I think, and I'm like not wanting to, <laughs> you know, expand because I'm just <laughs> everybody's. I've liked that too. Everybody's like that. Yeah, it's human nature. Yep. It, I oh man, and I, I I get like that. I get like that with elk. I get like that with whitetails. I do that so much, and and I agree that when you start moving along to to other areas and looking at it and then coming back to it then you find different things it's almost like say you're working on something and you've been working on it for hours straight and or like for me if i'm writing an article and i'm just like drawing a blank if i walk away and go do something else and then come back to it i have fresh ideas again Right. You know, or if I go and work on something else, you know, and so by going to a different area, you're kind of being able to keep things fresh and not get too complacent with it. Well, I can tell you, know, I'm just going to be since our second podcast, I think it's probably fitting that I start just, you know, being super honest about things. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, I like to think that I am pretty savvy when it comes to e-scouting. I think I'm right up there with some of the best as far as finding places that actually have elk. Now that doesn't mean I'm the best at killing the bastards, but I do (laughs) tend to go in there and have elk most times, but I can't tell you how many times I've looked at an area for hours, hours, fleshing it out, adding points, getting my custom markups all laid out, looking for spots, getting it all laid out, evaluating it. Like you said, I come back, and all of a sudden, I'm like, what? This is incredible. I, I didn't even see this before. I didn't see how this saddle feeds out over here. It didn't make sense how they were, how they might use these metal chains over here. And it just clicks at one moment. But it wasn't clicking the first time, our second time, our third time. You know, I don't, I'm not going to say how long it takes me to re, to dial in a one hunt area. My wife could probably tell you um, <laughs> how much time I spend on a computer screen looking at new spots. Like I'll be working on my course. I'm going to make some other um, come clean statements here. I'll be working on a course module. And this is probably the reason that some of the modules have not come out as on timely as they should have. And I'll be doing samples, you know, and I'll be looking for sample features. And all of a sudden I'm East County. All of a sudden I'm over here like, oh, look at this. <laughs> yep. And I'm like, oh, I got to get back. I got to get back to the module and I got to get going. But I do that. I've been doing that really bad in Wyoming. I'm looking for some new spots in Wyoming. And I, I use Wyoming for a lot of my examples. And uh, <laughs> all of a sudden I'm over here scouting for some of my own hunts. And it's easy to get distracted is what I'm saying. And it's easy to overlook things. And I probably spend, I'm just guessing four, five, six plus hours per hunt area minimum. So if you start thinking about five hunt areas for a hunt, if I'm going on a hunt on a Wyoming hunt and Bo, you and I are going on a hunt and you're saying, Mark, put together five hunt areas for us. We may only use one, but I'm going to have five ready. It's probably going to take me 30 to 40 hours minimum to do it, even with my experience level, because I leave no stone unturned. I look at every feature multiple times. I'm looking at zones of pressure multiple times to make sure I didn't miss anything. I'm looking at campgrounds. I'm looking at trailheads, all the things we, I mean, just I'm analyzing every trail. I zoom in on every established trail in my hunt area, every one. I want to know how much foot traffic it's getting. Can I see the trail? Can I not see the trail? Does it look like horse activity? Is it pretty distinct? Does it look like a brown ribbon running up through the drainage? That's giving me an indication to get some pressure. If I can't even fill an photo, then that's telling me, okay, maybe it doesn't get a ton. That doesn't mean it doesn't get any. It just may not be... So those are things that I don't know that the average hunter does. These are all things you can start using to change the game. But it's not, it's not just one of them. It's all of them. 
So systematically working through these elk find concepts and some of the other things in the course, if you work through them, you're going to start to see things develop that you might not see before. Yeah. And, and, you know, like, so I, I think what, you know, you're saying here is looking at the bigger picture of it and figuring out how these things work together is equally, if not even more important. And, and I'm maybe speaking out of turn here, but then, you know, just learning about a specific feature and that solely, but understanding how they say you maybe understand 60% of what fire zones are all about and the interest of it, but you understand more of how fire zones link together with some north facing slopes and benches and meadows and different that's things right. there that that's, that's right. uh, and a more important way of looking at it. And I mean, it's, it's, like I said, this, the, a lot of things you talk about just go, they correlate so well with even what, as you know, a lot of the listeners are doing and myself with Eastern whitetails. I mean, I'm always looking for areas that have multiple different terrain and vegetation features. I'm looking for logging cuts. I'm looking for different types of benches and slopes and points of ridges and, and saddles and all these different things that when you combine them together, when I'm looking at that, like those are areas that stand out to me that have a, a bunch of those odds multipliers when they come to the whatever animal you're hunting, finding concepts there. I think that, I think those points you covered on there, that's, that's is incredibly helpful. Well, like, just like you said, like fires, you got, you know, a lot of people talk about fires and how much elk really love that new vegetation that grows up and they do. There's no doubt. I'm just not disputing that for one minute, but all fires are not created equal. Okay. They're just not, you get a massive fire. Like I'm talking tens of thousands of acres. Those elk are going to be really concentrated in very distinct and very specific parts of that fire. You're not just going to roll out in that fire. I don't think in most cases, an elk is just going to be standing around everywhere. They're going to be, the elk will key in on, certain things in those fire areas. And I talk about that. I'll tell you one thing that I do with fire zones as a tip. When I see a fire area, sometimes I'll put a, 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 an area around it, meaning I'll take the polygon tool and I'll just real quickly, I won't be that precise. I'll just trace that fire. If it's not a gigantic fire, I'll just trace it and then I'll switch to topography layer. And I'm looking for every low point in that fire zone, all the low points, the lowest points. And I'm marking those low points. Those low points will grow the vegetation the first. So if I'm looking at a two-year-old fire, which is one of my favorites, a lot of people don't even think you can find elk in a, in a two. I'm telling you, I found elk and a lot of elk in one-year-old fires before. If they are not nuclear burned, like every fire burns a little different. Is it a crown fire? Is it a complete ground nuking root burning fire? You know, and so you kind of have to know these things. Look, and, and we and there's there's a lot of information out there, you know, that will help you determine what kind of fire you're looking at. But anyway, those low zones or those low points and those fires will be like they'll be neon green first. And those elk, then we see the low points, okay, and the fire. How are they getting to those, okay? Where is the cover? Where is the number that's the closest to the most low points? That doesn't mean that doesn't mean they're not going to hit this random low point over on the right or the left. But again, it's an odds multiplier thing. I want to see where most low points are and where the nearest dark ember or blow down, or whatever cover, security cover, there is. And then I'm going to start looking at the edge. What is the edge look like between those two, between the low point in the fire zone and the bedding, dark timber, so to speak, areas, and then where the edge meets, those are gold. I mean, man, that's a no-goosebump getter there. When I can find those types of things, I start keying in on those. And not just because it's a fire. I get excited about fires just like everybody else, but so does every other hunter out there. And breaking down into micro details, 
is the winning formula for me, at least I think, when it comes to fires. And same with beetle kills. You know, I really, beetle kills are way, 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 way underestimated. Elk love freaking beetle kill areas. They feel comfortable in them. There's some canopy. There is some thermal protection. But the sun's just, the, I mean, I've been in beetle kills where the grass is just deep. The vegetation is just chest deep green and other places it's ankle deep there's something about just giving just enough sun and just enough shade especially in the west to create the optimal growing environments and i think beetle kills are one of the best uh if they're the right aid of beetle kill a beetle kill there the beetles just went in there and started killing they haven't removed the tree canopy. The needles haven't fallen yet to a great degree. Those haven't fully developed yet. And on the other end of the equation, a 15-year-old beetle kill, and I say that because roughly about 15-year mark, ponderosa pine and spruce, maybe even less for spruce. They got even a smaller root system. Those trees will be starting to hit the ground about that 15-year mark, and it can become a nightmare. That doesn't mean the elk won't use them. It's just going to mean it's going to be incredibly hard to hunt. And they've kind of lost some of their thermal protection capabilities. They don't provide as much cover. They don't provide as much security except for the down timber. They certainly will start falling and inter interfering with the ground vegetation growing up amongst them. You've seen, it looks like matchbooks, sticks just piled up after a certain period of time. And if you don't analyze these beetle kills and really have a good understanding of how to approach them, you can roll into an area that looks great and you didn't realize the aerial photo, I've had it happen to me multiple times, not much anymore, but in my past, I look at the aerial photo, I'm like, oh, this is great, great, and get there, and there's timber all on the ground because I didn't look at nature. Or there was a wind event, or there's something that has caused that beetle kill to hit the ground, and it becomes almost impenetrable at that point. You can hunt them, but they're difficult. And so there's a lot to it. I mean, it's just not as simple as, well, there's a beetle kill. There's going to be elk there. Same with fires. Same with logging areas. Sparse timber is a little bit different. It's a pretty consistent environment. It's just sparse timber. It's not sparse because when I say sparse timber, it's not sparse because of necessarily because of beetle kill, because of fires or logged. It's just sparse because maybe the train, trees just are growing. As, as dense or some other reason, maybe the slope, the degree of the slope is limiting the growth. But anyway, those things all, you know, have very specific features that, that I like to look for. Yeah. I, I think, um, so when you, when you're talking about like these beetle kill areas and, and looking at them and I'm guessing, you know, with what you were saying before about looking at all these different aerial imageries can probably help, help you identify that ones that are downed, you know, might be down now where in a different, um, image, it might not show that. Is that, is that something that you're looking at? Well, let me give you, let me give you an example. Let me give you an example. So. And I'm not going to, I'm going to throw them all under the bus here. It, it, the hunt platforms, okay, are the worst beetle kill analysis tool you can use. The worst. You go into Onyx, you go into Gaia, you go into Base Map, you go into Go Hunt. I'm just going to say them all because they're all the same. You have no idea what image you're looking at, what year that image is. And I'm going to give you an example. I'm not even going to name names. But when I did the beetle kill module, I was looking for examples of fresh beetle kill. I was going to show in the module, I go through endless numbers of pictures of aerial photos showing you stage after stage after stage of beetle kill examples. So I wanted some examples of some fresh, when I say fresh, one to three-year-old beetle kill. So I was in one of the hunt platforms and I found this big, widespread beetle infestation. It looked like, to me, I could see the gold-colored pine trees, meaning they look brown. The pine trees had a brown, almost a purple haze to them, okay, from that kind of area. Just a brown dots. Not every tree was brown, 
but let's say 70% of the trees were just brown. When you really zoomed in, you could just see brown. What that means is the beetle kill the beetle kill that tree, and the tree still is holding on to its needles, but they're all brown. Okay. That means when you see that, that's typically a one to three year old infestation. Typically. Depends on the environment. There's, there's a lot of factors. I wish it could be in that, but it's just not. If you did some more research on beetle kills, just saw, there's a lot of information out there. Maybe you can uncover more specific stuff for a particular area. But when you see that, that tells you that, okay, that's a new beetle kill. The sun's probably starting to hit the ground. That might be a good place to go. Then I jumped over to Google Earth to the same area and just so happened. Now, Google Earth does not have very many of these yet, but this one just happened to have a 2019 imagery. I don't know how much, I don't know how many times you've run across the 2019 imagery, but it is freaking exceptional. You know, every year these these satellites get better and better and better. And man, these images that are available are just, I mean, you can practically read license plates. It's so good. Not really level, but it's good. So I found a 2019 imagery for this area and the timber was stacked up like you took, like you took and just flattened it all out. <laughs> Every tree on the ground, man, you talk about a, you talk about a sad day. You drive all the way into this area. You invest in this spot. You go in there. You saw it in the platform. It looks like a, a beginning stage of a beetle. It looks prime elk habitat. And you get there, and it's on the ground. Because that image was so freaking old in that hunt platform that the new image, it was, that stuff was already, it had already matured and had already the ground. So the different stages of beetle kill is the brown phase, and then you're going to start to see the gray-purple phase. I don't know what Onyx does with their aerial photo maps, but when it comes to identifying red, like lost the needles, Onyx is gold for that. It, they must enhance their image. They do something with their images. They process their images somehow. I don't know. I'm not claiming to know. I'm just telling you. That when you got dead beetle kill trees that are still standing and they're gray, and on that they will present almost as a shade of purple. So it really helps to pick out beetle kills sometimes. But you have to be careful because you got to make sure you got to be sure what age, or at least try to verify what age of image you're kind of looking at. So when it comes to beetle kills, you have no choice. If you're going to look at beetle kills. You must use Google Earth Pro, or you're running the risk of all kinds of risks, like the example I told you. If if you're trying to, I guess in closing, if you're trying to evaluate beetle kills and you're trying to make a judgment call on, is it still going to be standing? Is it all going to be on the ground? Is it going to be, you know, is it going to be new enough that there's going to be a lo- some light but some shade? Then you almost have to commit to using Google Earth Pro because you really need to look at that historical timeline slider and you have to drag back far enough to where you can start to see the brown crowns. So kind of to back up, when a beetle infests a conifer tree, usually, not always, but usually, the first part to die is the very top crown. So that makes it real visible with the aerial photo imagery. You'll see the brown dots. They'll really, they'll look kind of like in a sea of green, a dark green, there'll be these just brown dots all over. And a lot of times that's indicative of a new or recent, fairly recent beetle infestation. So I like to go fast forward five or six years into that, maybe even a little less. I like to hunt beetle kills that have dropped most of the pine needles, not all of them. I'll I'll hunt a mature beetle kill, but I really get excited about beetle kills that are in the process of about, let's say 50%. Let's just, let's just make it easy. 
50% of the needles have dropped. So how do you know that? Well, you're going to see a mixture of brown dots and gray trees, okay? You're going to see the dead trees mixed in with some of the ones that are in the process of being killed. You start to see that mix, that is really a prime elk sought after beetle kill, if that makes sense to me. Once they've all turned gray and there's no canopy anymore, I feel like they became become a little less attractive to elk. And once they start to hit the ground, the elk will start to use them for security purposes as much or more than they'll use them for feeding. So, and they're very difficult to hunt and navigate and, and get around in. Yeah. So, but there, it's a very difficult process. If you're going to commit to hunting beetle killed areas, you're going to want to really get in on the age of that beetle kill. So without going into too much detail in the course, in that module, I probably wear that concept out. I, I spend a lot of time breaking that down into the nth degree, probably more than he wants. But there's a lot of research on this topic. There's been a lot of publications on beetle kills because it's been so widespread in the West. There's just a plethora of information out there that I just mine and research. And I actually learned it's always been one of my top elk hunting places, but man, I sure learned a lot with preparation of this beetle kill, just about why I like these spots so much. You know, one of the things I want to say, Bo, real quick before we move on, you mentioned this before about, we were talking about this really great area that you found in Colorado and how it related to some of the things we were talking about earlier with drainage. Guys, one of the things you can do is just think back to where you really found elk and you really got into elk. Get on your computer, and start looking where you saw these elk. You dropped a waypoint, I'm sure. At some oh, point. yeah. I got a bunch of them. <laughs> yeah. What what features are present? What are you seeing? What elk finding features that we just talked about are you seeing? Where are they at? And, that, what, and where do they lie in relation to those encounters? And I think I'd be willing to bet some money on the fact you're going to start to see two, three, four, or more of these features start to show up. It won't be just because it was this random standalone North Face slope out there in the middle of nowhere. Now, it might be, but in most cases, I think you're going to start to see linkage, so to speak, of these elk finding features. Yep. And, and yeah, as I'm, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, you know, in that specific area that we're talking about, I can think of... I can think of five of them off the top of my head without even looking at the map, just remembering the area and even like, and then thinking of other places that I've ran into elk and by, you know, looking at how many elk finding features that were there, same thing, probably five to seven in, in those ones as you're, as I'm, you know, again, thinking through it. And that just makes so much sense. It's good. It's really good. And, uh, and so, you know, don't take my word for it. You might look at the list or think through that list and then go back to some places that you've encountered some elk or and start to figure out why they're actually there. Yep. I don't know that hunters do that enough. I think they just, I don't think hunters, elk hunters always do that. I think they just, well, I saw elk there. I'm going to go back to there. And I don't know that they've ever stopped and thought, well, why are the elk there? Let's investigate what makes that thought different than this spot over here. And, you know, everybody probably knows this by now. If you don't, if you're a new elk hunter, this is an important tip. You're not going to drive out west and roll up to Trailhead X and walk in some random national forest spot and be an elk every time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to happen. Now, you might get lucky and you might have the mother load, but I'm going to tell you most times that's not going to be the case because if that was true, the success rate wouldn't be in the four to 10% range. <laughs> and so elk do not inhabit the biggest majority of the West. That's hard to understand. I know they actually inhabit relatively little 
of the square footage or square acres or square miles of the West, they actually inhabit relatively a small portion. And you are tasked with the job as an elk hunter and not only being great shots with your bow, not only buying the most expensive backpacks and equipment you can find. (laughs) (laughs) That seems to be the trend. That seems to be the trend these days. But really what it comes down to is how are you going to go about finding the elk? Let's not worry so much about the killing of the elk just yet. That needs to be dealt with too. And that's very important, but you can't kill. I say this all the time. You can't kill what you can't find. And you're going to have to start stringing together concepts. If you're going to be a 50%, a 30%, or even a 20% success elk hunter, if you're going to kill an elk one out of every five years that you come out West from the East or Midwest, you're going to have to get really decent at finding places that hold elk. And if you really want to get in the 50, 60, 70% range, you're going to have to become exceptionally good at identifying places that, that, that elk want to be. Yeah. I, (laughs) yes, I, I am when, as you're talking about these things again, Mark, I mean, this whole time it's just spurned so many different things in my head and, you know, taking, like you're saying, taking some of those features, say where you found elk before dissecting that area, kind of recapping what you're saying there, you know, dissecting that area. Why were they there? And okay. Say you ran into them in a, in a morning in a, a specific spot. Okay. Well, if you were to hunt, go, be in that area in the evening, where might they be in correlation to that? You know, is, are they going to be bedding in there? Are they going to be coming to, to food? Are they going to, how does that look? And then also being able to take some of that knowledge and applying it as you're e-scouting some of the other areas. You know, I didn't mention this before, and I, I'm sorry I didn't say this, but, you know, one of the modules in the course before you get to the elk finding concept is an hour long module on the basics of elk and don't underestimate that educate yourself whether it's with the course it doesn't matter wherever you educate yourself you need to educate yourself what do elk eat why do they eat it and what times of year do they eat what most elk hunters that you would talk to say well elk eat grass all the time that's not true that's actually not even remotely close Elk eat grass actually a pretty small portion of the time during the year. Now they'll eat it, but they won't seek it out. It's not their preferred for a lot of the time. They love forbs. They love leafy plants. They love woody plants during certain times of year. And elks, the stomach of elk too, the way they work is they're not able to eat. Now this isn't It ain't like they're not going to do it from time to time, but predominantly they're not going to focus on all of the varieties of foods, their stomach and their digestive system has to get used or adapt to the changing food sources. So if this makes sense, they'll go from one to the other, to the other, there won't be a lot of the sampling. It won't be like a buffet for elk. It ain't like they'll eat grass in the morning and they'll eat brush in the afternoon. <laughs> and now that doesn't mean they won't nibble on it. It doesn't mean everybody, I've seen elk do it. I'm, I know, I hear you. But if you study the basics and the science, you'll find that the digestive tracts are very unique and that they have to kind of change the system over, so to speak, to get ready to digest a different type of vegetation. And so during the season, you know, they're just more keyed in on different things, more. They'll still eat a little of everything if it's available. They're very opportunistic, let's be honest, especially the winter time. I mean, they're very hungry, they're very opportunistic at that time, but they will seek out certain vegetations throughout the year and, What I'm trying to get to is if you really spend some time understanding the basics of the food sources and how they relate to the generalities of elk and really try to read studies in the areas that you like to hunt because New Mexico elk do not act like Montana elk. 
Okay. I don't even know what the hell elk eat down in New Mexico. I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> it's like, there's nothing to eat. I don't know how those suckers get horns. Like they get, they eat like they eat. I mean, it's just blows my mind down there. The vegetation is so sparse and so brown and so unappealing compared to Montana. But the elk thrive there. They absolutely thrive in those environments. So I'm not saying I don't understand some of it, but it is a it is a puzzle. And so wherever you're hunting, you want to make sure you look at some of the re- and there's research in every state. Every state has it. If you want to spend the time on Google the most powerful e-scouting tool available to you and educate yourself. I spend quite a bit of time in the basics module, but I don't delve into every state maybe like we should. So what I'm trying to say here again, I, I keep saying that, but educating yourselves on the basics will help you when you move into the elk finding concepts. Like you'll start having an understanding of what the elk are looking for in your area. And when you start looking at canyon creeks and drainages and these flat spots on these drainages and these meadows and what type of meadows you're looking for, you know, you you mentioned this earlier. One of my key concepts when I evaluate meadows, Bo, is I'm looking for meadows that have various shades of green. Subtle, but they're there. If you find meadows that have the same shade of green, what that's telling you is there's pretty much it's grass or it's a vegetation that is widespread throughout that meadow. What I'm looking for is texture and various shades of green. Find various textures and you can find various shades of green. What you're going to start seeing is diverse vegetation habitats. Well, you're going to see some grass mixed in with some forbs, mixed in with woody plants, and it's usually on the edges. You're going to see, I call it in the, in the course, I call it the halo effect. You're looking for meadows that look like they have a halo around the inside. And when you could start to see that halo in from, from the woody, or not woody, I'm sorry, from the timbered environment into the meadow environment, I talk about this a little in the course too. Most of the diversity of vegetation in, with an opening or an edge environment, okay, when you think about an edge, most of the diversity of vegetation occurs within 50 yards of inside the timber and out into the opening, 50 yards, most of the diversity. And those elk love that diversity. And you can almost count on the fact that even if you don't know what the elk are concentrating on during certain times of year, you can be rest assured it's there because that's where most of the diversity is. I hope that makes sense. I hope I explained that right. No, but, no you definitely did. So the, fur- so the further you get out into a meadow or a fire zone or an open area or a log area, the further you get away from the edge, okay, the less diversity of vegetation. And the same goes true, probably even more so, if you're going into the timber or shaded environments, the cover environments, you're going to see the further you get in, the less vegetation and the less variety, which is the key, the less variety of vegetation. So I hope that makes sense when you look at the basic needs and you know what the elk are looking for, and then you start looking at how that relates to these elk finding features it all kind of starts coming together a little bit. When you start thinking yeah. about fires, okay, I'm looking for diversity. I'm looking for diverse vegetation. So I'm looking for the low spots and I'm looking for the edge. Yeah. No, I, I think I think you covered that pretty well as far as like, or so taking, taking the things that you talked about specifically on, on this episode we did here, there's some things that stand out to me. If you're looking at a very high level, basic concepts you're looking at a lot of diversity and you're looking at those elk finding concepts you know not only in the detail but how they're all linking together and and then using past you know some past history if you're hunting an area and coming into elk and trying to figure out the backstory on you know why they might have been there and all and to to be able to look at it from that way did i did i take some good points out of there 
It's awesome. That's really good. <laughs> yeah, it's really. And guys, I, I, you know, sometimes it's hard for me to stay focused. I got a little bit of ADD. I think I'm just going to tell you. I started talking about some of these things. I'm like, man, I've got to get. I've got to squeeze that tip in, or I've got. So I know that I bounce around a lot. But I can tell you, I know the concepts we talked about in this podcast. This is one of those podcasts that's going to be incredibly beneficial to you if you listen to it once. Don't write anything down. Just listen to it. Just absorb it. And then go back and listen to it again with a notepad. We talked about some very subtle, very short and moved on. I got down the rabbit hole real quick on something else. But there are some very good nuggets of information in there that you probably want to get jotted down, in my opinion. They're they're key in the course, they're key with the way I pro cutting. And we we spent just a few seconds on them and then we moved on to something else. But yeah, I would recommend after kind of going through this podcast, Bo, you asked some great questions. We got into some things. But I would listen to it once, go back, and then just really listen to the finer points. And I think you'll be surprised at some of the tips that you might pick up or things that apply to you the way you want to hunt elk if you are hunting elk. If you're a beginner, you absolutely need to listen to this thing twice. <laughs> if you are a multi-year veteran, maybe you got it. Maybe you got what we were talking about. But the, from the basic needs to the linking together to the odds multiplying, to the specific way you look at the features, you know, that not all fires, not all be all these are not created the same, how you age them, how you approach them. Those are all subtleties that we kind of briefly talked about, but they're all worth maybe a second investigation. <laughs> yeah. I, I'll tell you, I'll be, you know, as I have to go back and listen to it through editing will be one thing. And then I'm going to listen to it again and, and write notes on, it, even though I'm the one talking <laughs> to you here. It, I, oh, I, I, there was a bunch of different things that, that I picked up on. I'm like, I need to, I need to write these down and I'm sure I'll get into a lot of them as I get to different parts of, of your course. But still, I think that I, yeah, I think you, you touched on that perfectly and and for everyone listening it's so difficult to to try to especially for someone like mark to be able to give um an overview of something because it's not that simple it's not as simple to be able to cover all this stuff in a podcast um but i think mark you did a very good job at covering it and getting into detail on those things i think that was incredible and although you said you called it diving into the weeds on it i appreciate that (laughs) because that that helps make my job easier (laughs) well you know the one thing i'll say too is we're trying to have a podcast here on a very visual concept yeah. <laughs> and it, it's real hard. It's very challenging to paint the picture sometimes without a, a image to look at. So this is great. This leads into the last thing I've got to mention. So I mentioned before, Bo, when I started, I was struggling with how I wanted to put this course together. Remember me talking about that? And then I kind of started coming up with these concepts. I'm like, that's that's how it works. But then when I made that decision, the next challenge I had, which I didn't mention, was how do I talk about meadows and feeding areas? Because I didn't want it just to be a just a blurb of knowledge just coming out of my mouth and just regurgitating it. I, I needed some structure. So the way I approached it, and I think you can be the judge, as I work through the modules, I'm getting better and better at it. But the way I do it is I teach about 30 to 40 minutes per module on theory, just like a podcast. I talk about, just like we've been talking about, I go through all of the ins and outs of meadows and feeding zones. For 45 minutes, I'm telling you everything you need to know well, not need to know. I'm telling you everything I know about sale cutting, about meadows and feeding areas, okay? Then I go to part two. Most of the modules are broken into two parts. Part one is theory. It is the down dirty dictation, if you want to call it. If you want to call it lecture, you can call it whatever you want about that concept. Part two is anywhere between three to 10. 
high level examples of multiple metals. Why this one looks better than that? When I actually get on the computer in Google Earth, in Onyx, in Gaia, I try to use it all kinds of tools. I use them every tool. I do evaluations and I do examples using every platform. And then we start breaking it down from a visual component. So it's hope, you know, the way I learned from the education world, you kind of read it and then you kind of teach it and then you kind of learn it. You become text, you become text driven and then you become visual and you got a better chance of absorbing it. So my hope is that by doing the theory first and then doing a whole set of examples that kind of relate to and back up and I'm hoping that the way I'm doing this in the course is creating an environment that you're able to really absorb it. And you can also go back. I wanted guys to be able to go back and girls. I got a lot of women taking my course. I don't want to hate saying guys. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> you can go back and revisit modules and quickly kind of the areas that you're interested in or whatever. So that's the way I've kind of approached it in the course. I hope that makes sense. I hope it kind of resonates with people. And that's kind of the way I'm proceeding on as I develop more and more modules and I finish up the course. I've got about three or four modules to go. I'm starting to record the late season module probably tomorrow or the next day. This one's been a beast. Um, I just, man, I've struggled with this one. There's so much information I want to share, getting it organized. I've spent weeks and weeks on this one. It's going to be a good one. It's going to be one of the better ones in the course, I think. But um, it's it, there's a lot of information in there. So I'm hoping to have that one done within the next two or three weeks and have it online. So. Awesome. I One of the things that, that it, it's funny that you said that about the learning process and then, you know, the examples and how important that is. And and I, I think I'm going to have to have you back on in maybe a few months here and just go through, have you just tell some elk hunting stories and then kind of dissect it. I, I like, I like that, that concept of it too. You know, you have the foundational stuff and then, yeah. you know, having specific examples and learning from those. I, I love, yeah, I think that's a, a great way. And I, I think that's why your course is so far. I mean, I'm not even close to being done with it as it, it's, it's something that, that takes it takes a while and and it's because of how detailed all these processes i love it i like it i i actually go through it i spend just be honest you can only take my voice be honest bo you can only take my voice for so long 15 minutes a day is all i can take of you mark no. <laughs> i should have you know what i if i if i did it smart bo i should have had a got a couple of narrators so we could mix it up a little bit <laughs> that's funny oh man but. so i do apologize uh about that my voice is pretty unique and uh i've had 13 throat surgeries so my voice has had a lot of manipulation over the years. That's a lot. So some, it's a lot. Well, <laughs> thank you. I really, I enjoy your podcast. I really love speaking to the Midwestern Eastern guys and girls. And I just, Oh, I love it. And, uh, they're one of my own. They're my soulmates in the elk hunting journey. So I I'll take every chance I can to get into that, to that population of, of audience. That's for sure. Well, I for one greatly appreciate it. I'm sure the listeners do too. So uh, again, thank you so much for coming back on here, Mark, give, give the listeners, uh, uh, again, uh, where they can find you, um, as far as social media, your website, your course, G give me all the details there. Okay, great. So uh, Treeline Pursuits, Treeline underscore Pursuits on Instagram. I'm really more active on Instagram. My Facebook uh, group, now I will say, you'll be the first podcast that I've mentioned this on. I had just decided, I had a closed Facebook group for members, of course, only. It's a Treeline, it's a Treeline Academy East Scouting Elk group. You can search for that on, on Facebook. And I created that for members only. And then I decided that I don't know. The course is 
I need to, I need to answer people's questions. I mean, you know, if, if nothing else, I, I want to give opportunity for people to engage with not only the members, but to me. So I created that group. I belong to a couple of other groups like elk addicts and non-resident big game hunters. And the information that's available in those groups is just crazy good. So those are two groups as well. If you're not members of those groups and you're hunting out, those are really, really great groups. Lots of great questions, really a pleasant environment. Nobody's bashing anybody. Nobody's, you know, I mean, there's some arguments here and there once in a while, but for the most part, it's really a great experience. So I wanted to create a very similar environment because I know people have a lot of questions and they, I know they may not feel comfortable sending me a message like direct message. And so I want to create this group and I don't like when people send me questions by direct message. It's not that I don't appreciate the answer, but if you've got the question, somebody else has it as well. So I would rather answer questions on a public forum so that, more people can benefit from them. You know, I, everybody always asks me why I do this. And it's like, I wish it, the bottom line is 30 years ago, I wish something like this would exist when I started. And, you know, I spent 30 years just learning everything I could and just chasing out like crazy. And the older I've gotten, I've just decided that, you know what? I need to share that. And if it makes sense to someone, so be it. If it doesn't, no big deal either. So that's just what I've done. And so anyway, I'm opening up this Facebook group to the public. It's open now. So it just opened up a couple of days ago. There's probably very few people in it yet. So you'll be one of the, you're the first audience to hear it. So, but Tree Life Pursuits and Instagram, treelineacademy.net for the course. If you've got any questions for me, I'll do my best to answer them on the forum. I guess if I get too overwhelmed, I'll have to shut down the group. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Anyway, I love it, and um, thanks for having me on. Bo. Yeah, Appreciate thanks it. so much, Mark. I'm definitely gonna j- join the the group here shortly and be one of the one of the beginning guys. <laughs> I'm gonna start. That's where I'm gonna start announcing some of these podcasts too. I want to have a a place where, when the information becomes available and this great podcast comes out, that people have a you know a reminder or a resource that tells them it's out i mean everybody you know everybody puts it out on their own platforms but this this will kind of live in perpetuity in this group and so um, i'm kind of looking forward to it and you know in the course i answer a lot of questions in the course there's a discussion forum in the course and i've been answering a lot of questions publicly when they ask i make a short video and i put it up on youtube i've done three in the past two weeks so if you want to check those out, you can go to my YouTube channel at Treeline Pursuits, and those are free, obviously. They're just good questions that members have asked that were complicated questions that I spent the time to record and edit an entire little short video segment on the answer. But those are the kind of things that I want to insert into this group as well. So it's not all about getting people to join the course. I feel like if people want to join the course and they see value, they will. But my job is to just put some information out there and do my best to share the amazingness of elk hunting. And, uh, and I've got other courses I'm starting to work on too. So uh, tree light Academy will be the, will be the depository of some of the other things I'm going to be working on in the coming year. So. Awesome. I, I love it, Mark. Well, uh, again, appreciate you coming on and, and talking here again. I feel like we could, go on for hours on any of these topics so thank you for for taking the time and and sharing your knowledge i think everyone appreciates it yeah thanks bo till next time see you buddy thanks so much for listening to this episode of east meets west hunt with your host bo martonic for more great content and to stay up to date visit east meets west hunt.com facebook at east meets west outdoors and instagram at east meets west hunt if you enjoyed today's episode please review and subscribe and we'll catch you next time